checking. go like this. Good morning. We're here at 
Today's panel, what does the data say? Analyzing the gender digital divide. And we have with us Eileen Agüero from the center Latam Digital from Latin America. Alison Gilwold from RIA, Africa. Um, Helani Galpaya from Lirne Asia. Muge Haseki from the University of Pennsylvania. And Claire Sipthorpe from GSMA. Um, so what we're going to show today are the findings of a survey large survey in 20 countries from the Global South from 2017 from to 2018 and also some case studies. Mm -hmm. um, this is in terms of the after access survey. This is around its fifth round of surveys around Asia Africa comparatively finding from Asia Africa and Latin America. And the world case studies will show the who are connected, what works, how to connect unconnected women with a focus on women. We have practitioners, researchers, and think tanks. And this is particularly interesting from the demand side perspective. What are the inequalities in terms of gender? They usually mirror the inequalities in the world. And I'm sure these insights will enrich policy design. So um, let's start. If Alison, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think we usually don't start the panel until there are more people in the audience than the panel, is our sort of global south rule on this. I think we've just got there, so we can, we can begin. Thank you very much for getting here um, early to attend this session. Um, I'm going to just introduce the after access surveys, which were done across 20, uh, over 2017, 2018. Um, this is actually the first time that these demand side surveys have been done um, using the exact same methodology across the Global South countries that we cover. Um, traditionally, um, Learn Asia and um, DOSI have done bottom of the pyramid studies, so these do go back some way. Um, but we've now conducted this um, over several years across Africa, so we've got some longitudinal data on this. Um, the original countries that were covered with um, a grant from the IDRC, from the Canadian IDRC, International Development Research Center, um, are the ones in blue that are, uh, sorry, the ones that are not in yellow on here that have already been completed. In fact, the other studies that were um, supported by um, Swedish CEDA um, are also under completion. In fact, a couple of them are completed and will be on the um, integrated data set on the After Access website um, very shortly. Just to say a few points about the um, countries that are being studied and the methodology that's being used, this is a nationally representative survey. We work off the national census frame. Um, we do a nationally rep national representative sample. We then do um, a proportional sample. Um, in, we do a um, listing in, of the um, enumerator areas. We um, identify the households. We sample further in the household. So there's three sampling um, periods to ensure that the, the, the uh, data is representative. Um, and I perhaps what just distinguishes us, because there's a lot of um, gender data out at the moment. Um, historically, there have been um, a number of studies done by the World Web Foundation, um, the GSMA. Um, Claire will speak about the connected women studies that have been done. Um, there's recently a f another study out that's been using the Facebook data, the big data. Um, and what you'll see is that the uh, social networking data and the um, access data, the connectivity data, actually mirror each other. So there is an enormous similarity there. So the point is you can now begin to get some of the basic connection data, although historically there have been problems um, with the overcount of connectivity from the supply side data, that's the operator's data, which traditionally has counted multiple SIMs. And the only way you can really find out 
who that sim belongs to, get the disaggregated data, and model that data, which I think is significant in relation to the big data that's being used, because although the big data can identify the connectivity through their algorithms and things we all know from the advertising we're receiving, they can determine probably the likelihood of that person being a man or a woman or other, um, but what they can't do is actually say what they're doing, it, what, what is a barrier to their use, those kinds of things. That's the, uh, that's the information we can only get from the demand side data. So I just want you to emphasize that because we will see similarities with some of the data. The problem is, of course, that we don't have data um, at the global level. So we've only got these um, country, you know, these regional um, insights. Um, and the country insights are actually even more specific. The context is absolutely critical at, at a country level. Um, Thank you. So just to show you the very high level um, uh, data, that is the integrated data um, for everybody at the national level, um, you will see that um, essentially uh, Africa still continues to lag, these other countries. There are some similarities across the African and Asian countries. Um, Latin America is far, um, uh, you know, the, the, the penetration levels are far greater than in the other areas. But essentially what we're seeing is that um, internet penetration, mobile phone um, penetration, um, and in fact social media use, which is the other um, blue little block that you can see there, actually track um, GNI or GDP per capita. So the countries that are doing, um, you know, that are richer, basically have better penetration rates than the countries that are, are, are poorer. But there are some anomalies there that are quite, um, quite important um, that we, uh, we should also see. For example, South Africa fits from a GNI point of view more comfortably into the Latin American countries, and yet its penetration rates are not as high. So there are enormous inequalities that are masked um, in some of these figures that you don't, you don't see. And then also very interestingly, and I'm, some of the, um, uh, in the other slides people will speak about some of the other regional variations, but for example, um, you know, Rwanda, which has been um, highlighted as a connectivity example by the World Bank, by the ITU, et cetera, actually has less than 10% penetration, so the lowest penetration um, of these countries with the um, highest gender gap, in fact, of 60%, very like the Asian countries that um, uh, Eileen and Helani will speak to. Um, so I'm going to stop there because we've got a very short time to run through some slides and we'll come back to, to um, some of these. But basically, you know, the, 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 what we're seeing at the, at the global um, level is correct in terms of some of the other data that's coming through, um, but we can't actually go beyond just the connectivity data, just the descriptive data from even the big data or from the supply side data. So we need to do um, this demand side data where we can actually do the modeling, and then we're actually able to identify the exact points of policy intervention. So we see from this modeling, for example, that the main drivers of this inequality are, are, are um, education and income. And so addressing the gender issue is actually about addressing the education and income index. That's the, you have to do the modeling to be able to get to that data. So let's go back to the, some of the descriptive statistics um, and we'll come back to that. <coughs> okay, so to begin with, we wanted to show some data on smartphone uh, ownership. So as you can see in this slide, uh, basically, in Latin America, most people have, um, they own, they do own smartphones. And this is important because this is an, an opportunity for them to come online. While in Asia and in Africa, there are still more challenges in that regard. And when we look at the, um, the smartphone gap, um, yeah, this is the smartphone ownership gap. Um, the, the male-female gap. And uh, as we can see, in Latin America, again, this gap is not that significant. But you will see later that this gap, smartphone ownership, smartphone ownership gap is much uh, smaller than internet, the internet use gap, for example. But still there are challenges, for example, for India, for Pakistan, Bangladesh, in Asia, and in, in Africa, in Mozambique, for example. So this is another gap just in broader terms, um, in terms of um, just mobile phone ownership. And in here we find that the gaps are a little bit like larger. 
Again, in Latin America, it's not that significant. And all over the indicators, you will see that in Latin America, I'm speaking because I'm, fr I'm from Latin America. So the thing is that uh, even though we find these, um, these rather small uh, percentages in terms of mobile phone ownership, smartphone ownership, or maybe you will see there in terms of internet use and social media use, um, there are many issues that are masked in these, in these figures. Uh, from qualitative studies, we have found that there are still um, challenges for women when they are online. We will see that the, the situation is the same in Asia and in Africa. Uh, the, all the stereotypes are reproduced in the online world. There are, um, like for example, women are expected to just use the internet for beauty <laughs> tips or to help children with their, their homework or for, to look for recipes or things like that. But for men, they are expected to use it for work, for, um, yeah, to get to the news and many things like that. And these opinions come both from men and women. So this is a really hard challenge. But well, going back to this, we see that another important gap is the urban-rural gap, which is much larger. So we, we do not only have the problem for women, but also if you live in a rural area. In Latin America in particular, maybe you want to comment something on Asia and Africa, we have, um, the issues are related to geography, isolation, scattered population, and it's not economically viable to offer the service there. Especially in my country, where I come from, there are like in Peru, the Andes and the jungle, th this is a very um, hard issue to deal with. Would you like to comment something on this or in Asia? Yeah, perhaps just differently, um, in, in Africa, we, are, we see in many, part, in many countries that there's actually 90% um, uh, GSM coverage, broadband coverage, 3G or 4G, um, and yet we've got you know, penetration rates of less than 20%. Um, even though there might be smartphone ownership of 50% in Lesotho, for example. So there's a, you know, although it's technically available, it's actually reached a, a number of people. These are obviously not very, very remote communities, um, but it's covered, you know, large parts of the country or large urban areas, but people simply cannot afford the service, cannot afford the device. Um, so th you know, it's not only a, a, a coverage and reach issue. So I think Asia is interesting. India has a high gender gap, as does Myanmar. Myanmar is the most recent country to sort of roll out networks. And they've done a very good job connecting people to the internet compared to many other Asian countries. But the rural areas are still getting coverage, which is why you see um, a 33% gap. India, again, same. The rural coverage is sort of still ongoing. Pakistan and Bangladesh are the interesting case here. So Pakistan has historically had, I would say, one of the few successful universal service funds in the world, properly managed and actually connecting up rural areas. So that's why you see quite a low urban-rural gap in Pakistan. And Bangladesh, which is incredibly flat, m there were operators who, after covering Dhaka and Chittagong, like the two areas, actually went completely rural and started covering. It's, it has enough density in most areas to uh, cover in the rural area. So you sort of see different population density dynamics working as well. Thank you. So we also um, wanted to show the divides or the gaps in terms of internet use and social media use. I think, yeah, it's here. Um, we had a separate module on social media in our common questionnaire in all the three regions because for m we found out during the pilot phases, that in many, in many cases, um, people didn't know that they were coming online through social media. Like they were saying, we use Facebook, we use WhatsApp, but we don't use the internet. So um, without <laughs> even knowing it, they were already having an opportunity to, to use and get some benefits from the internet. No? And uh, this is a much, a much larger gap as compared to mobile phone ownership or smart, smartphone ownership. And again, as I was saying in Latin America, even though the, the figures are not that, not as large as in, in Africa and Asia, there are many, many uh, problems to deal with. And finally, um, we wanted to show the gender gap in terms of mobile money use. Um, as you can see in Kenya, this is really small because of M-Pesa and all the tradition that has been there in, in this country. 
and um, it's still high in India, for example, and in Nigeria. In Paraguay, it, there is a, um, like, it's not that high, that, that gap, because the government has had a special focus in promoting the use of mobile money. They had a special regulation more or less like eight years ago, and they're trying to uh, get more people into using this, especially women. Okay. Now we will continue into the barriers for internet use. So um, one of the good things about surveys is you don't just ask, talk to users, you get a whole lot of non-users as well. And we asked them uh, about the first barrier, because you need to get a device in the hands of people. Why is it that you don't have any kind of device? Not a smartphone, but why do you not have a phone? Uh, and you can see, sorry, what's the barrier? Up, yeah. No, no. Okay. Right. Uh, the most common reason given in most of the countries is affordability of the phone. So even though we're talking about even smartphones being under $30, the Chinese and Indian made smartphones, and they are incredibly affordable if you look at national level income statistics, when you go to the lower income deciles, they are actually increasingly unaffordable. And this is just basic phones, which are significantly cheaper than uh, the $30 smartphones. Affordability is also a perception thing. So if you talk about a country like Myanmar, they want the $300 Samsung. So they will actually delay purchasing until they can afford that expensive thing. So we're not talking asking about the price, we're asking about people's perceived affordability. So affordability in these multidimensional ways is still the biggest barrier. Sorry. The uh, second biggest, so that's the yellow boxes I had. The next one is not knowing how to use a phone. So we asked people for the main barrier, uh, and in one, two, three, four, about five countries, you see quite a significant barrier as the main reason, which is I don't know how to use it. So these are things that can be addressed. Sorry, the slides have a life of their own. <laughs> and interestingly, in Africa, as you can see, the red dotted line, Nigeria, Kenya, Rwanda, and Mozambique, we still have that old electricity as the barrier, which is interesting. This is not something you really hear in Africa, right? Not being able to charge the phone because there's no electricity in the house. So you kind of see these regional differences when it comes to other supporting infrastructure. Then we asked them, so that was about the device. We asked them, why do you not use the internet? And in this green highlighted, and these are, by the way, the high population countries. We have India, Nigeria, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Ghana, not that high, but still. Or in all these countries, not knowing what the internet is, is a huge barrier. So there's an awareness barrier to be crossed. Then, if you look at the bright blue that I've highlighted, you can see most of them are kind of to the left, so the richer countries, because this is ordered by richer to poorer, the, uh, the barrier is uh, not knowing how to use the internet. So they know what the internet is, unlike Nigeria, India, Pakistan, but they don't know how to use it. And in some of the poorer African countries, and interestingly in South Africa, which is not a poor African country, you still have a high percentage of people who say, I don't have a device, and that's my main barrier. We had a module on other use. We asked them, you know, what are the applications that you use? Then we asked them particularly about things that put money in the pocket, help them save money, increase economic efficiency. So here are two things about the usage of apps related to transport and trading, e-commerce. And this is about the use of these as a consumer, not the selling of labor as a driver, but as a ride-sharing person, for example. Have you used these? So first thing that you see is these are quite low levels of use. Most of these countries will have the Ubers, Olas, the big grab, and you know we think these are common. We come here and we use this. We go to Myanmar and use it, right? But these are actually incredibly low use is the first trend that you see. And this is about using. 
I can't even show you the people who are actually selling their labor, selling goods on the internet, uh, getting jobs on the internet and earning income because these are statistically incredibly low numbers. So that's not even, cannot even be discussed. So it's really not pervasive, the economic impact of earning through the internet. But as consumers, we do have some use, sort of, you know, in the 30, 40 range in Peru, that's high, but everyone else really below 20%. And some of these gender gaps are sort of, you know, you need to take it with a grain of salt, you know, between 2% and 3%, the gender gap looks huge, but actually this is, you know, within the margin of error. But in many of the other countries, you do have huge gender gaps, again, like Peru, Ghana, and so on. So again, on average, men are much more likely to be using these apps uh, than women are. Now, let's not even try to read this. Uh, but let me talk to this, which is we asked a whole module about what is your social media behavior? What do you share online, you know, about your level of trust and so on? So as you can see, in most countries, gender, real name, age are things that are quite commonly shared. These are the high bars, right? And in some, the platforms force you to share it. You don't really have a choice, especially if you post, post, uh, post photos. And almost all countries, religion, political views, sexual orientation are things that people share the least on social media to a public group. Again, don't even try to read it. And you, this is the gender disaggregated. Red is in a country, if it's lower, green is higher. But you can see quite consistently, if you look at a country like India and Pakistan, women are continuously in the red column, that is they share less, consistently less, all of these things compared to men. In Pakistan it is the same, in Mozambique it is the same. And from other qualitative research we know, so it's interesting in Asia we had a lot more questions about harassment. Men actually report higher incidence of harassment as a percentage of men, which is interesting, but I think the question is problematic. You know, have you ever been harassed in these ways? And we had five types of harassment, including physical, threatening, uh, sexual harassment. But men are also more online, more frequently. So we need to have a better measure like the airlines do, you know, seat miles per passenger flown kind of thing, right? For the number of times that, or the amount of time they are online, this is probably then will equate out, I think. But interestingly, then when people are harassed, we ask them, where are you harassed? On what platforms? It's mostly on social media. And then what do you do in reaction the problem is I limit my use, I completely go offline, other answers that we get. And in countries like Myanmar and Cambodia, they also get fake accounts. Ma females have a male account, minorities have a dominant majority account, Muslims have a Buddhist account. And this is, you know, some people have 12 accounts that they use every day. It's not something that, you know, I just had an account. They're actively participating in political discussions, in religious discussions. You have a completely different identity for a lot of the public sphere participation because of all the problems and harassment that many of these people face. Alison. So the thing about the um, research, as we were saying, is that we've shown you here some of the high level um, statistics. We've disaggregated the data, but the descriptive statistics can still mask certain things that the modeling allow us to, allow us to see. Um, and so the important point we were saying about the, a lot of what we've seen here, about the participation, about the inequality in the participation, actually relates to you know, fundamental development issues that we faced all along, inequalities in education and correlated inequalities in income that allow you um, to participate more effectively. But interestingly, in the, as we move from the voice to the um, data to the internet world, the complexities of it and the challenges mean that the human development challenges become even greater than they were with voice. Um, that your ability to participate not only from consumption, which we've mainly focused on here, but your ability to produce on the internet, to optimize the internet for well-being and for also, you know, um, uh, national growth, etc., are very dependent on addressing some of these fundamental um, issues. And so, we, you know, the central policy question is that, um, in fact, as we are connecting more people, the central paradox is that as we're connecting more people, we having we're seeing greater inequality. Not only um, inequality between those and offline and online that we've been speaking about, but between those who are producing on the internet, using it optimally, and those who are barely online, able to, you know, um, just connect for a few minutes on the price of the data that they've been able to buy. Um, so, 
the other important thing that we haven't had much chance to speak about, but Helani has spoken to about, about it here, is while we've emphasized that the quantitative data is a nationally representative quantitative data is able to address certain issues, it was also unable to address certain other issues. And the qualitative research that goes to um, understanding some of these is equally important um, and is also um, reflected on our, our, our various websites. But I think the most important thing that's um, possible through the um, modeling and also required um, far more extensively in the qualitative work is understanding the um, intersectional nature of inequality that you know once you begin to overlay um, in, a, in a very sort of quantitative and, and um, very unsubtle way um, gender rural you know income all of these things education that you're able to do with this data one can see that it is um, you know a rural women in certain areas that are more marginalized than others, but it also provides a granularity. So for example, in some countries we see that poor urban women have greater access than rural um, men, for example. So they, you know, the um, rural urban divide is really as important and equally important and very much att attached to education and income as, um, as gender is. And one really needs to understand these in an integrated way to address them um, uh, from a policy point of view. And essentially, you know, we, we keep sort of speaking about the di getting things equal online, digital um, uh, uh, rights online, digital equality online, but in fact, these are simply reflecting um, structural inequalities in our um, economies and societies that need to, need to be addressed and often require, you know, much bigger um, political and policy interventions um, than simply a, a connectivity or infrastructure or you know, reduction of a service price. Although those are important things, and I think just broadly as a last point on what the sort of broad policy implications of this are, is that yes, um, there are inequalities between men and women generally across this enormous number of countries and data sets, et cetera, with a lot of qualifications and variations in different um, contexts. Um, but th that inequality um, really, uh, you know, um, we require um, multiple strategies to get everybody online and because women are concentrated at the bottom of the pyramid because they're concentrated amongst the disconnected these strategies that get everybody online will get um, women online too and we saw that with mobile phones with mobile voice um, as you got Coast approach saturation. Actually, of course, everybody was now online, and so you got um, equality between men and women. That's not to say in many countries, as actually women um, with more um, access than, than, than men in, sev in several countries. Um, so short-term strategies are really about, you know, finding different models that can reduce prices, finding ways to reduce those barriers. So these taxations that we're seeing, this social networking taxations, these taxations on handsets, um, in countries that are, you know, committed to uh, digital visions um, is completely counterproductive. We need to get rid of um, taxes on low-cost devices. We need to find um, affordable uh, uh, public access, ways of getting public access to people, so increasing public Wi-Fi strategies so that people can buy their cheap device, buy their little bit of data that they can afford, but then access, you know, various... Um, essential services and, and, and other services, communication services um, through public forums. We need to find ways of reducing spectrum. Um, we need to find ways of uh, reducing costs generally so that we can get um, more people online and that will bring more women online too. Thank you, Alison. Um, move on. Muge from the University of Pennsylvania. Hello everyone, uh, this is Mugge from University of Pennsylvania. I am uh, currently working on a project um, that's called One World Connected that focuses on uh, some case studies that we have been gathering over the past couple of years. 
so today I'll be giving some examples and sharing some stories from our case study project. Um, so to begin with here, you see a photo um, that shows what happens uh, when there is heavy rain in rural areas, um, especially with uh, poor infrastructure. But what you also see here are two men uh, on their bikes getting around the muddy uh, roads. Um, so some, uh, one of our projects uh, actually show that uh, just along with the findings in uh, existing research, infrastructure affects women more than men. Uh, so one of the projects we have focuses on uh, rural areas in Burkina Faso for which um, health centers are provided uh, mobile phones, uh, the health workers are provided mobile phones uh, to help with the pregnant, to help to pregnant women. But when there, are, uh, when there is heavy rain like that in rural areas, it's much harder for pregnant women to be mobile and access to health center. So they cannot actually you know, um, get on the bike and uh, go to the health center to uh, use those resources. So to adapt to this challenge, uh, they came up with a different idea and uh, they decided to give the, health, uh, the mobile phones uh, to young health workers and so that they can get on their bicycles and uh, go to the houses of the pregnant women in rural areas. But then what happened is um, the young women who were given uh, young uh, health workers who were given uh, bicycles got some resistance from their community because uh, men and local opinion leaders were resistant to the idea that women are uh, riding their bikes in rural uh, areas. So uh, this is just an example to show not only the uh, difference, what happens to like the, the inequality between men and women, like these kind of structural inequalities, but also there are, we see differences in ter within, the, within women uh, in terms of their uh, age or sociocultural norms like that, or um, whether their marital status, so that affects them from accessing resources. So our, um, the, the couple of arguments we draw from our key study, which is along with what Alison Gilbert uh, emphasized on intersectionality, is that women, uh, in terms of access and use, women face unique constraints with respect to various demographics, uh, factors such as age, education level, marital status, economic status, and geography or social cultural context. And relaxing just one barrier may not improve their access and use. And therefore, some policies that target mainly those uh, group of women may not be effective or cost effective. So we need to take an intersectional approach for interventions and policy. Uh, what, and we should look at the immediate con local context of these women. So let me back up a little bit and uh, give you a little bit of information about our project at the University of Pennsylvania. So uh, over the past couple of years, we have been identifying and compiling grassroots level initiatives that focus on uh, connecting the unconnected communities and to facilitate their adoption and use. So uh, we have uh, identified more than 1,000 projects and conducted 120 in-depth interviews with those grassroots level um, organizations. And these focus on uh, gender, education, digital literacy programs, agriculture, e-government, uh, and as well as some supply side interventions such as extension uh, of coverage. So these are the, uh, uh, sorry, my, I, I was going to do all this. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, um, this is the uh, snapshot of our 15 case studies from across, across the world, which I'll be giving some examples uh, over the course of my talk, uh, mainly uh, why we should focus on intersectionality, and I'll be sharing some stories from those case studies, um, why this is the case. So when you look at the existing literature or research from surveys, uh, so there are some overlapping barriers to women's ICT access and use, such as infrastructure, financial constraints, safety and security, digital skills, perceived benefits, and sociocultural barriers. 
but, but as I open up in terms of infrastructure, when you look at this, these specific barriers, women also face some unique uh, challenges and maybe those challenges exacerbate for certain uh, group of women uh, in certain areas. So here are uh, two different uh, groups of women from our case studies. The, so the first one uh, is uh, a project called Amakomaya from Nepal. They uh, provide a mobile phone uh, application to facilitate communication between a pregnant women and um, the health workers in rural uh, areas in Nepal. And on the uh, right hand side, you see a young woman in, Af in, in Ghana and at the tele center, they are uh, provided some digital literacy skills. Um, it's a project by Africa ICT, right? So um, when you think about the financial constraints, so these two different groups of women face different kind of challenges when it comes to financial barriers or access. So in, in the case for Nepal, for instance, uh, when people get married in Nepal, they move to their husband's house and most of the time their access to mobile phone uh, is controlled by their husbands and their mother-in-law. So when they want to get data, for, uh, for instance, uh, their mother-in-law thinks that, okay, if you have the data, so other women would, in the, in the community would come and would like to use uh, and ask or request to use your phone, and so that will be like costly. So they uh, discourage them from getting data uh, for that reason. But then when you look at this uh, young woman on the right hand side from Ghana, so they get more uh, constraints from their parents uh, because they are taught, the, they are already provided uh, ICT classes in their school so they don't think that you know, they need to pay some extra money for them to attend to these classes. Sometimes you know, these classes are free but for them uh, instead of going to these free classes, they can use their time uh, to work outside of the home or to help the family. So when it comes to uh, safety and security, again, we see different women from different geographic areas and from different so social and cultural contexts face different barriers. So this is one project, uh, one case study uh, based in Bangladesh. Uh, it's uh, uh, by iSocial. So initially they uh, came up with the idea of uh, opening telecenters to facilitate women's access and use in rural Bangladesh. But what they found out, as you see from the first photo here, uh, that when they opened the telecenters, uh, only or most of the time men uh, use those telecenters than women. So then they again, they had to uh, adopt their project uh, for which they provided um, bicycles to women who can go and visit uh, young uh, women in their homes to provide them some resources. So they provide one-on-one -on -one, uh, digital literacy training or they provide some one-on-one -on -one information uh, on their tablets to those women. But again, they, they face some ch uh, resistance in their community by their opinion leaders. Uh, similar to the case in Burkina Faso that women uh, are not encouraged to use bicycles, uh, especially young women who are, not, who are single. Um, and so for, for young women, for instance, uh, in Bangladesh, they thought you know, the, the most secure place for them to, in, to access the internet or to ask questions was their home. Uh, so this is another case from, uh, th that's another project from Sri Lanka where uh, women felt more secure around uh, at telecenters near temples. So it's, when you talk to people in different contexts, you get different uh, kind of information in terms of where is the best place to access the internet or who, whom they feel comfortable with talking. 
Again, um, in, in Bangladesh, in rural Bangladesh, women, um, most, they mostly need the kind of information um, about um, like women related uh, health information, which they only feel comfortable to talk to women. Uh, and when you ask the same, like similar case in Sri Lanka, they find, uh, more, they find themselves more comfortable around temples at the telecenters with people who, whom they already know. And in terms of uh, perceived benefits and relevance, again, when uh, the programs uh, create their curriculum, they need to take into consideration of the needs of the women they are targeting. So on the left, uh, you see a woman from rural Rwanda who, who is a farmer, and they usually need mobile phone uh, to access information about the sellers and buyers in their areas, or uh, the cost prices. These are main uh, kind of like information they need uh, through their mobile phone use. Whereas uh, this is another project in South Africa and uh, they are provided a mobile application to provide information about um, maternal and infant health. So they mainly use mobile phones to communicate with other mothers uh, to ask for advice or recommendation and also get some information related to health. So when you even uh, providing just one, um, like one structured curriculum that targets all men would not be uh, useful just because they would not uh, think that, you know, that targets or that addresses their needs. So when the interventions uh, or digital training programs um, just focus on basic, you know, literacy skills or how to use on uh, the internet to find jobs or um, how to like search information in general that would not be uh, uh, that would not be useful for them so they would not see any uh, perceived benefit so these programs again should address you know what the needs of the women are and how they can um, create a curriculum that women would find the most useful and in terms of socio-cultural uh, context, so here is a photo from a um, community network uh, in rural India um, from Grand Mark, it's a, a community network. Uh, so this uh, photo shows that uh, they, to facilitate the access of women to uh, the network, uh, especially in the dark, so this is a house they identified in their community where they can all gather to access the network. And the one benefit of the, the community network leader is a woman, so they find more comfortable to speak with. Uh, one of the questions uh, we found out, um, one of the like, most in, uh, common questions that come from women was um, questions about abortion. So, which is a, again taboo for women to, to speak with other people in their community. So when they, and most of the time because they share their phones with their husbands, they don't want that kind of information to be visible to, to them. So what they were asking to their community leaders are, is how I can search information on abortion and yet my husband would not see it on the history. So these are the kind of uh, sociocultural barriers, even when they share phone, they cannot or they are scared to uh, search for information that they want because they don't want them to be seen by their husbands. So again, when we think about the access, they may have internet, they may have data, they may have device, uh, but again, they will not be able to search for information if they know for a fact that their um, husbands or uh, their mother-in-law will not see that information. So going back to our main arguments. So women, based on you know, where they come from, whether it's like rural or urban, whether they are single or married, they have different aspirations and motivations and needs. So um, for that reason, just relaxing just one particular barrier on infrastructure or access or sharing devices may not improve their access and use. So therefore, the policies just target mainly women like, uh, and thinking women as a homogenous community would not help 
every, all of them. Uh, so therefore, um, just uh, along with the Ellison Gilwell uh, uh, words, so we need to take more an intersectional approach when we think about those interventions or create programs uh, and making policy. Thank you. So, thank you so much. Thank and uh, my contact information, if anyone would like to uh, have our 15 case studies on gender, I will be happy to share. Thank you, Mindy. Claire? Hi, um, my name is Claire. I'm uh, with the GSMA, which is the Industry Association of Mobile Operators. Um, as Allison mentioned, we also do a lot of research on this issue specifically uh, on, on uh, so I lead the program that run, looks at gender, on the gender gap. Um, we all know that mobile is the main way that people are accessing the internet um, and accessing many of these services, so we think it's really important to look at, you know, what is happening in terms of the gender gap. And we do um, an annual study looking at the mobile gender gap in terms of ownership and use. Um, and f basically have exactly the same findings. It's great to see that we all do these big studies and have similar findings. That's reassuring, but also slightly alarming about the scale of the problem and the kind of challenges we have to address. Um, so we, so for example, um, our research shows that if you look at, uh, you know, there's an ownership gap. Um, uh, which is preventing women from having basic access, but there's also a much bigger usage gap. So if you look at, um, if you look at, um, we look at low and middle income countries and women are 26% less likely to use the internet on their mobile phone than men. Um, and it grows and it's, and that's a sort of global figure or low middle income figure, but it grows depending on what region you are and which, um, whether you're urban rural. So for example, in South Asia, it's at 70%, women are 70% less likely than men. These are staggering numbers of women who are now being excluded. Um, if you look at uh, mobile money, which is again a service which is uh, providing a lot of financial inclusion for women who don't can't get access to a bank account, women are 33% less likely to use mobile money. That's based on the FINDEX data. Um, so we do a lot of research on this on this topic. Um, we do both uh, household surveys. Um, we look at operator data, and we also do qualitative research to understand, you know, the reasons why. It's not just enough to know that there is a problem. You also have to understand not only the reasons why, but what are the opportunities for driving uh, to drive kind of closure of this gap. Um, we, after we published our 2015 study, which looked at this issue, uh, our members, uh, mobile operators, um, joined uh, Connected Women Commitment Initiative, which is they are making formal commitments to reduce the gender gap in their either mobile internet or mobile money customer base. So they made a commitment with the baseline and then set a target. I think that's really important. Um, it's not just sufficient to say that, you know, we're going to tackle this issue and address women. You need to have concrete data to inform it. What is your baseline? What, do you, what is the current state of fair and what is the target what are you trying to aim for and how do you measure yourself against that if we don't have clear targets it's going to be very hard to to, to work on that so we're we we're very delighted we had um, 36 operators make 51 commitments to reach women um, in the last so over a year and a half they've now reached more than 12 million new women um, through these efforts so and what have they been focusing on? And they've been focusing on the issues that our research has been identifying, and I think that's also why um, this data is important. So first of all, they had to, to make the commitment, they had to know the gender gap of their customer base. You would think that could be easy. Um, it's difficult to both have it from the surveys, but also within the specific customer bases, it can be a challenge because in many cases, especially in South Asia, where there are social norms that prevent women from going to a store to, to, buy, to buy a phone or to get topped up, um, many men are registering on behalf of their wives and daughters. So um, it can be very, you don't, you might know your customer who's registered, but you don't know who's using it. So that's a big challenge. So what we did at GSMA is we've now created a, a machine learning algorithm where you can, where it can, you can look at your data and you can, it can, predict, um, and we've had over 85% accuracy uh, predicting, you know, what is the actual user of that SIM card, because um, that is an important step in terms of addressing this issue. So we have a, it's a, we have a toolkit, it's publicly available, uh, is a resource available, um, and this algorithm is available, so um, our members are, are starting to use that. Uh, it can be used by anybody who has, uh, if you're, um, I think it's important for anybody who's looking at customer, not just operators, but anybody who has customers to, to look at that, uh, how you can identify the, correctly identify the gender. But then once you know what, your, what the problem is and you've kind of looked at not just at the kind of national level, but also like are you looking at urban rural, different age groups, again, women are not a 
homogeneous group. You need to look segment where the problem is and what the issues are. You need to tackle the barriers that women are facing. And as has been highlighted, um, there are many barriers and it's uh, driven by structural inequalities between men and women, uh, especially in terms of income and education and strong social norms in some countries. Um, but having said that, as Alison was saying, you know, there are some practical steps that can be addressed while the kind of bigger problems need much longer term intervention. And again, our research also shows a similar that affordability is the number one barrier, both in terms of ownership of phone, but also data costs of, of accessing internet data. So one needs to attack, uh, tackle affordability. Um, women, um, again, have, tend to have often lower incomes or less control of their finances. Our research shows that even in, even in contexts where women are earning income, in some contexts because of social norms, they are not the decision makers around the purchasing of the phone or the, or the data because of the sort of social norms. So there are constraints around that. So women, if these barriers that I'm mentioning affect both men and women, but they just affect women disproportionately because of these norms. Um, Accessibility is another key issue, and it's not just around access to networks, it's also um, access to IDs, access to agents. Again, in some contexts, women can't go out of the house as, much, as easily. So some of our, what our members are doing are having sort of things like female agents in contexts where it's not appropriate maybe to meet with a male agent, roaming agents, um, you know, tier at KYC, um, uh, uh, policies to again make it easier for women to access these services. Um, another key issue, uh, uh, again, has been reflected by many of the conversations today is around relevance. You know, how do you ensure that the products and services are relevant to women, meet their needs? Do people understand what is it that women are using? Again, we've done some research recently in South Asia and in a few countries in Africa which looked at um, if you removed affordability, uh, so if you just looked at a certain income group and you removed the lack of networks, you know, what is stopping women from using the internet? So, the, you know, they can afford it and they're in an area with coverage. So what what's stopping them and what are the opportunities? And we you know, highlighted some of the kind of main um, desires and needs for, for what was triggering their use. And a lot of it was around things like um, being able to have video calls with friends and family, some very practical things that people were wanting um, to do. So I think sort of understanding what is relevant to the different segments and different groups is, is critically important. Skills, again, is another big issue. Not just the skills to use the internet, but also the awareness of how it's relevant to them. Again, a lot of our research highlights, you know, that's something for others, that's what rich people in the cities do, or that's for, you know, for others, you know, so, you know, how is it relevant to, to, to their, to people's lives, making it sure it's relevant, making people sure understand how it's, how it can be used. And the other one, another big barrier um, is around safety and harassment. And we saw, we did a t study in 2010, and it didn't come up as a barrier. 2015, it was the third biggest barrier. We're seeing it increasing. We see it not just in low middle income countries, but around the world, um, online bullying, harassment of women. So these, this, this sort of harassment, phone theft, and um, harassing calls from strangers, all these things are, as more people get access, these issues are also growing in importance. And so, again, some of our members are doing things, very practical things like call blocking services, um, anonymous top-ups, so you don't need to give away your phone number to reveal that you're a woman uh, when you're topping up. You know, very practical things to try and make it safe, women feel safer and protect them. But I think that's an issue that is uh, of growing importance and one needs to tackle. So I think there's a, a range of issues. I mean, these things need to be tackled holistically. And again, our research shows similar um, to what the University of Pennsylvania was sharing, that this is not, you can't just tackle one of the barriers. It needs to be a holistic approach. And when we see our partners tackling them in a very holistic way, looking across the barriers, that's where they have the kind of biggest impact. It's not, you can't just tackle one, um, but it also needs a lot of, um, it can't just be done by people like the private sector alone. It needs a lot of intervention from different stakeholders. It needs to be, uh, one needs to tackle some of the systemic issues that are facing, um, which is a much longer term uh, a problem and uh, a thing to tackle, but I think it needs a, a multi-stakeholder approach and a, a strong focus and intervention based on a strong understanding of the data. The data can, can really highlight, you know, where the issues are and what we need to focus on to address them. And with, in absence of that, and sadly there's too little of it, um, it's hard to, hard to kind of both take action and but also measure progress. Sorry, thank you. Um, it's an incredibly rich uh, set of data, in-depth data. And uh, a lot of this, I think, you know, the ones we've been studying this affordability and, and all the barriers to connectivity know about. But what we see here, I think, is we're at a different level of in-depth about knowing the details of 
of the barriers and the you know the drivers in general. So I'm going to open up the um, for questions, the Q and A for the audience, but just a, a small question to keep in there, and we'll gather some in the audience and uh, with the remote uh, participants to the panel. Is there was many many things, and I think we'd need you know you'd need to write a book about all these things. Um, including, you know, striking things such as increasing connectivity, increases in equality, um, and then the intersection between all of these. But I think that, um, you know, as I, I think it was you, Allison, you were mentioning the fact that the importance of, of a higher intervention, you know, the in intervention at a more structural level. Yes, it is long term, but it's also urgent. You know, it does reflect stru structural inequality. And we've talked for many years about increasing spectrum in the market and doing all these things we all know in terms of regulation. Um, but we need an urgent intervention at, at a more structural level. The, my question directly is, in your findings, do you see anything, I think, Helani, you mentioned in Pakistan, um, universal funds work? Mm, which is not usually the case in other countries, not because the concept, I think, it's because governments don't spend the money or other reasons, but do you see any other association between good indicators and policy in general? It's just a, a, a more general question for, for the panel. Um, so should we open up uh, questions from the audience here? And do we have a remote questions here? If not, maybe you can start with mine. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, absolutely, we, we, there are sort of short-term things we can do. Um, but I, you know, I think especially when one's doing the micro-studies, and the, the important as they are, it's important to have the um, systemic outputs, the systemic outcomes, so that you can address them uh, systemically. Um, so, you know, we speak about affordability, um, but we have to understand that in the context of the, um, you know, competitive markets, of the regulation that is there, if we're going to address them, we have to do them in a sustainable way. So, for example, in many countries in Africa, what we're seeing now is um, the political pressure to reduce prices, and prices have been reduced significantly. Um, but what we're not seeing is further investments in those markets. So that actually um, expansion of the internet is actually being inhibited so, you know, because there's just simply not the investments in the market. So I think it's a very tricky thing. We've got to actually be thinking out of the box in a completely new way. We've got to think about new ways of licensing. We've got to think about new ways um, of uh, regulating the market. We've got to think of new ways of using universal access service funds, and if we should be collecting them at all, because they're actually a premium on services, they're not used effectively, um, so they're not you know, delivered to the poor, the poor aren't getting those services, et cetera. So you know, where there are these big funds, um, let's use them for public Wi-Fi or something that you know, could be more successfully addressed than subsidizing the incumbents to already extend networks in a very often a very sort of expensive um, technology networks. We need to um, think completely differently about what technologies we um, use so that we can get lower cost business models, so we can use secondary spectrum, so that we can enable community networks which are scaling and ready to, to offer services. Um, move away from national, you know, very expensive big national licenses that um, you know, you don't use up a lot of the spectrum in the rural areas that could be used for dynamic spectrum at much lower cost to, to reduce services. And then, of course, you know, governments need to sort of not speak out of both sides of their mouth. They can't be, you know, putting pressure on operators not to, to, to bring down prices, but then not make available spectrum, et cetera, that would bring down those prices to, to use the, the um, spectrum more cost effectively, but also then at the same time putting on these um, really regressive taxes on um, devices and on now on social networking, um, which in Africa is used very much as a cost mechanism to overcome the high cost of voice and, and text services. So although the data is expensive, it's much cheaper to use um, than uh, traditional voice and, and, and text messages. So it's a really 
you know, counterproductive um, intervention, although it's made on the grounds of kind of public good taxation um, sort of grounds, it's not redistributed effectively, it's not um, built into the system to support it and sustain it and extend it. And sorry, just bringing down those costs will bring more people online and bring, as I said, proportionally more women online as well, because they're the ones who are offline. I'll just add one thing, uh, which is, again, going back to the idea that at this point in most of Asia, if you increase connectivity in general, you're actually going to bridge the gender gap because it's mostly the rural women who are not connected in Asia, right? So, and one of the biggest problems many operators will tell you is rights of way. Um, so there are big incumbent operators who own fiber, not even incumbents, but large operators, you know, maybe some new ones. Uh, they're not often forced to share it. So the rural or the remote base stations are running microwave. Many have an interest in now running fiber, but you have to negotiate with 20 different government departments. And maybe 50 farmers who have their rice fields between point A and B that you're trying to lay the fiber with, and the local governments do not facilitate this. So all of this increase the time and increase the cost for operators to deploy infrastructure, particularly in rural areas uh, where there is no other existing fiber. So this is really greenfield development. Uh, and that's, you know, in pa countries like Pakistan, in Myanmar, they'll cite this is one of the big, the last mile is one of the biggest problems. The situation is similar in Latin America, that's what Helani was saying. Everything depends on who's in power and then coming, bringing together all the different sectors that are involved. Like, for example, in Peru, we would have to bring the education sector, ICT sector, and um, the, even the culture sector. Because, like, for example, we have found in our quantitative studies that the gender gap in Peru particularly and in Guatemala, it depends basically on cultural factors, on stereotypes, sexism, things like that. While in Argentina, Colombia, and Paraguay, the gender gap depends basically on education, income, occupation even. No? Yeah, I would just like to add it. So, I mean, I think connectivity is really important, um, and it's, I agree, it's a complete, it's an economic problem. I mean, it's uh, the cost of rolling out, the, both the app, CAPEX, CAPEX and OPEX costs are, for rural areas are really high. It's, I think, two times, to, uh, twice for the, ca twice as much CAPEX and ten times as much OPEX. Um, so it's a, definitely an economic problem that needs to be cracked, and we need to think about, you know, how do we get policy and regulatory environments that enable that to be cost effective. There's no way of rolling it out if it's not cost effective. But I also think, so I think con connectivity is an issue, but I actually think um, it's not just about connectivity. The access alone isn't going to solve this problem. If you look about it, there's over one billion people who don't, who don't live in areas with mobile internet coverage, broadband coverage. Um, but there's over three billion who live in areas of coverage who are not using it. So actually it's three to one around the usage. So even when people are, there is coverage, there is this huge gap around usage, much bigger than the coverage gap. Um, so I think if we're really going to tackle this sort of the gender gap, I think we need to, I mean, yes, we need to get coverage out there, um, but it, that itself is not going to solve it. We need to tackle what are the, what are the issues that are stopping people from using it, and, is, and it's not the kind of, it's sort of phone costs, um, the social norms, the data costs, the lack of digital skills, those sort of things. So, so, I, think, um, so I think there is, needs to be a two-pronged, but I think we, we can't just focus on just getting the networks out. We need to also get so that people can actually use them and address this usage gap, and this is where we, can, we see a huge, a huge gender issue playing out. So. Thank you. I, I, I guess in what you were also saying, you know, you need multiple strategies and, and text, we, we know what they are, you know, rights away, spectrum out there, um, competition. Um, so it's about the effectiveness of these regulatory policies, but it's also, I think, what I'm thinking of what, but what you said is really about an integral, integral policy, um, something that goes to education, capacity building, and what would you think of a um, um, digital agency in, in terms of it having the internet as a general purpose technology uh, as transversal to all these sectors, you would need an agency, an entity that would monitor and lead an integral policy between the 
Ministry of Education, the Ministry of Economics, the Ministry of Agriculture, and now even thinking of Internet of Things and all these. Or how do you get all these multiple strategies I was together? To the audience, but I, I was just going to say in relation to the um, beyond connectivity issues, the beyond access issues that we have been concerned with and uh, that we're, we have been touched on. But I think um, an interesting um, outcome of these studies was actually um, the section that looked at um, cyber security awareness, privacy, um, and those kinds of issues. Because I think, you know, in uh, many of these, particularly gender and gap kind of sessions, we tend to focus on it with the, all the assumptions that these are all very positive outcomes. Um, and I think the, you know, the vulnerability of the less educated, of the poor, of the people, are, is that they're actually unable to um, either assert their rights or protect their um, rights. Very often in these circumstances, they simply don't have the technical awareness, the, the awareness or sometimes the technical um, ability to enforce it, etc. So I think, um, you know, it's becoming increasingly important that alongside this sort of very um, uh, sort of positive uh, connectivity um, discourse, and theory, we begin to develop, you know, really in-depth theories of harm that go with each, um, re you know, regulatory in intention that we are trying to get out. What are actually the aspects of bringing a whole lot of people online that are completely unable to um, either, you know, protect themselves from surveillance or from um, harassment or whatever these issues are? And then, of course, it raises the issue, which I think you know, was very controversial in the president's speech yesterday. But you know, what is the role of the state in protecting individuals? Um, all their citizens' rights um, on, online? Is it actually through, you know, because I think there's been a lot of resistance to, you know, content type agencies, broadcasting type regulation um, of the internet. But, you know, what, is, what are the ways that we are going to um, protect citizens' um, rights online? Um, you know, is it an integrated digital agency or is it actually something even more cross-cutting um, across um, sex society? You know, regulation right across it's not a sectoral issue anymore but it's a you know something a, a digital agency or digital economy mm -hmm. thing that would have a component that would take care of that because I think it's the, the cyber security these kinds of things at the moment are sort of um, in our justice departments or they're in the international relations and there's quite a sort of siloed um, approach there so we're looking at connectivity but we're not actually looking at those negative aspects that could accompany it questions Questions from the audience? Yes. Hello. Uh, I'm Pratik Sibyl. I work at the CI sector at UNESCO, and we are also working on digital divide. And uh, I had a sh short question for all the panelists. Uh, are there any projects that you guys see which are related to inclusion of LGBT communities in, in the online space, in discourse, and what are the special challenges maybe they're facing in getting part of the, you know, accessing information and things like that. Thank you. Question, um, and one that we actually picking up and doing further research on together with um, a group um, within the um, IDRC who are supporting a range of feminist um, literature and, and, and research. but especially with these um, quantitative indicator research, um, within the UN system, it's been very difficult to um, introduce non-binary um, indicators. Um, so just, um, uh, uh, Judith was saying that we need a book on this, and I just wanted to say that actually Equals is producing a book. Um, which, um, the ITU um, UN Women's Project is producing a, a book in which some of our research, but lots of other people's research um, is in that. And in that process, there was an attempt in the working group, people from universities across the world, to try and introduce a non-binary um, uh, notion within the um, indicator, within the uh, self-identification self or something, because it's obviously enormously difficult in some countries to actually have an official questionnaire because we work with the census bureaus, et cetera, that would allow that kind of thing. But, you know, India has a self-identification other um, in their formal, you know, official documents. So it's not that it's not practiced. But the UN agency's positions was that it was too difficult with member states to actually um, have, you know, introduce LGBTQ or whatever, you know, other 
and other self-identification indicator in this. So that's purely at the quantitative level. There's obviously a lot of other um, research going out. APC has done enormous amounts of um, research in this area and several other, other groups too. But from the um, measurement side, from the um, indicator side, it's an enormous challenge. And we are hoping in the next round in some of the countries where you know, the, our pr country partners feel that it's fair to do, et cetera, that we will um, try, we will um, introduce it. But that's in the next round, yeah. I'll add something really quick to that, which is, um, I mean, we don't look at projects per se about inclusion, but when we look at phenomena like remote work and micro work that people do without the buyer and the seller meeting, you know, doing translations remotely, graphic design, website design remotely, and so on. So we've looked at that in Asia, sort of in detail, quantitative and qualitative ways. And you see these sort of pockets of, for example, in Myanmar, we find the, a lot of the English to Myanmar and Myanmar to English translators identify as non-binary LGBTQ, you know. And they talk about actually the ease of getting work because nobody knows who they are and you don't have to necessarily, you know, you, you can take on if you are born, you know, sexually female, but you now have a gender male, you can post your male identity and nobody's gonna question you, you still get work. So those barriers that they face in going to a face-to-face -face interview, interestingly, are removed uh, because of this remoteness of the work, because you're taken at face value for whatever picture. Yet on the other hand, on platforms like um, Facebook, uh, some of the highest shaming is faced by women and gender non-binary people. Uh, so very commonly, a very common form of harassment is your photos being taken and photoshopped, that's the term, and reposted in a way that brings you shame. And uh, non-binary sexual people are, you know, in that group along with women as the ones whose photos are commonly taken, photoshopped with, you know, animals and dogs and reposted purposely uh, to give, bring shame to themselves or families. Um, it's not part of this research, but still IDRC funded. We did an informal sector survey in Peru in the urban sector, in a particular um, area of the capital city in Lima, and we tried to introduce a way of how to um, include this, this, this group. So we, it was a challenge to find a question. We worked with sociologists and anthropologists and everything, so we were trying to find a way of like, addressing the question. But in the end, no one said something else rather than female or male. So at least it, quantitatively, it's quite hard. So I think we need to think of other ways of um, addressing this issue. Do we have a remote question? Participate. Yeah. From the audience? Well, I think that anything else you'd like to? Well, congratulations. It's very, very interesting and a lot more to learn. So you need to do another round. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for coming.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You did a great job, although we needed more questions.